Good morning, or good afternoon. In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good day. Uh, so today in class, what we're doing, we're looking at uh, some notes over chapter 19, section 2. Uh, so yesterday, we started looking at inventions primarily uh, with the, the railroad um, and technology kind of leading the way in uh, section 1. Uh, the age of inventions is uh, in chapter 19, section 2. Uh, and within a generation, uh, you know, starting in 1876, uh, we go from 1876 to about, you know, 1908 when cars are kind of efficient. So in a 30, 40 year time period, uh, we go from having no lights and no cars uh, and no planes to cars and planes and lights. Uh, so that was a POD a while back on how to kind of think about uh, if you were kind of an older person and you're maybe not uh, really into technology so much, uh, you could uh, really uh, be uh, kind of lost without a car or being able, able, able to ride in a plane uh, or uh, have electricity in your house uh, or potentially even a telephone. So when we're looking at uh, all the things that we have in this chapter, uh, that is kind of what our focus on, is on. So uh, when well, we're looking at these inventions today, uh, on Monday it looks like uh, if we're hopefully back in class, uh, we'll be able to uh, see these things in person. Now, uh, in class today you need to fill in what we are going through. So, uh, to get full credit for your assignment, you have to uh, go through and fill in the right answers. So as we're going through here, um, New inventions help people communicate. So you need to write down uh, the first thing. Oops, sorry. Right. Communicate. So if you could write that word down in your first blank, uh, if you could maybe do a split screen here so you can see the screen and uh, type in at the same time, you'll get credit for filling out your notes uh, for this first section. Now there's a lot to it um, in section two, and what we're going to be looking at uh, on uh, Monday, hopefully in person. Uh, is some of these inventions and as they uh, take shape we'll be uh, trying to make our own electricity and kind of experimenting a little bit uh, and hopefully we get to make a, uh, a light bulb and uh, see a typewriter and these were uh, cutting edge inventions and technology from back in the day. So new inventions help people communicate more quickly over long distances so whether it's um, you know it's a telegraph at first uh, and you know you wouldn't necessarily get telegraphs every day uh, especially if you're unpopular like Mr. Hopkins, but you know maybe on your birthday your mom uh, who lives uh, on the East Coast and you went out west to, to mine for gold uh, would send you a birthday message. Happy birthday. Uh, so to get this uh, and to be able to uh, make communication happen, we'll kind of explain the whole process uh, as we go through today. Uh, it helped unify previously isolated regions of the U.S. and promoted economic growth. So you wouldn't feel so isolated if you're going out west to work on the railroad uh, if you can have a little bit of conversation with people maybe. So the invention of the telegraph is one that uh, started in 1844. My goodness, guys. Uh, with uh, Samuel Morse. Now Samuel Morse uh, invented a system of dots and dashes, which I keep clicking back and forth to, uh, with Morse code. So a series of uh, these depends on how long it would uh, last. So it would be a click or a beep. Uh, so a short beep and a long beep uh, would be A. So if we're in class, and we may do this on Monday, I'll put, some, I'll put the key up there and I'll ask you to translate it. Now people that were trained in Morse code, uh, they may have worked at the Western Union Telegraph Company, uh, they would have been able to uh, here, so they they would be able to kind of translate uh, those kind of things pretty quickly. I know that's kind of annoying, especially if you have this on speakers. Uh, you might be annoying the rest of the people in your house. So I'm sorry for that in advance. Uh, so by 1860, thousands of telegraph lines were controlled by Western Union. Today, Western Union is more of a, a banking and financial institution, uh, but they first started in the industry with telegraph lines. So just like telephone lines, who owned them got to make calls on them, uh, kind of like power lines, I guess, more so today. Um, so whoever owns the line gets to, to run the power through it. Well, operators were trained in Morse code, and they would relay messages throughout the country. So if you're a, a shop owner here in West Frankfort, Illinois, uh, you could, from Ace Hardware, um, text your order or Morse code your order. Um, 
to Chicago where they would you know, get a new product ready for you. So this saved a lot of time. Uh, it's kind of like uh, how many people prime in their house. So if you guys prime, uh, you'll know part of the, the, the big deal of prime is having it at your fingertips. Well, shopkeepers were able to, they didn't have to keep such a big supply of random stuff. Uh, because now in two days they can have whatever they need from across the country um, real quick because they'll get the order in from a local person they'll Morse code and send a message to the uh, the business uh, the business will put it on a train and keep bring it to West Frankfurt, Illinois. Uh, reporters to send about big stories <laughs> and personal messages uh, all everybody was using Morse code. In 1866 right after the Civil War Cyrus Field sent a message across the Atlantic Ocean. So while we're looking at uh, the messages and how we're looking at how people are now going to be able to connect together, now we can connect countries together. It took about 12 days to get a message across the ocean in 1865. But in 1866, it took about 12 minutes. Uh, and how this worked, it was um, kind of an energized cable. Uh, they suspended uh, toward the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and they ran it uh, from here to there. So here is that code chart uh, that even has numbers on there. So when we're looking at uh, how to decode this, we'll play these for you in person because standing having it uh, on audio is not great during the screen recording. Uh, but you can translate some stuff. There's a Morse code translator. It gives you some codes to type in um, or some words you can type in. It will translate it for you. Uh, so we'll go, to, go through that on Monday and see how fast it goes. Uh, better than the Morse code machine, uh, and there's that transatlantic line like that, uh, is the telephone. Watson, come here, I want you. For the first line, first words ever transmitted through a working telephone. Now, there were several people, and when we say the word inventors, um, the people that patent the idea first sometimes get credit, while somebody else may have already technically invented it. Um, so when we look at, uh, especially in this chapter, we're looking at uh, thousands and thousands of patents being issued. Um, and a patent is just your uh, stamp on it, kind of like a copyright. If you have a hit song out there, you copyright it, no one else can steal your lyrics, or even the, the beat of your song uh, without paying you a royalty, as it, it's called. So uh, same thing with uh, patents. Uh, they would, uh, they have this one patent and no one could uh, steal their idea. So uh, Watson was Alexander Graham Bell's assistant. And as Bell was tinkering with this device on a way to transmit speech over long distances. Uh, this is fancier than a cup and a piece of string that picks up the vibrations. So he accidentally and, uh, transmitted the very first thing because he had spilled some battery acid on him. Uh, and without saying an expletive, like, you know, not I would, but I mean somebody that uh, uses poor language may have said something very, very harsh. Uh, that would have been terrible if that was the first thing that ever went across the radio signals or the, the phone signals. Uh, but as he's screaming for his assistant Watson, uh, Watson didn't hear him through the wall but heard him through this device that he was working on. Um, so Bell in 1877 uh, and through 1876 uh, was working on this telephone. And by 1890, hundreds of thousands of phones were in businesses. So it may have connected a building you know, from the third floor to the first floor. Now we're increasing productivity because it used to be hey, you got to take the um, take the message from floor one to floor three. Uh, I, if you've seen the movie Elf, uh, they've got those things kind of like at banks uh, where they, they shoot those messages real quick. Uh, and that was their most efficient way of getting messages from floor to floor. Now the telephone, pick up the phone, hey, I need this, this, and this down here pronto. Uh, and lots of people were able to um, make more money that way. Uh, at first, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there was only one person you could call. Guess who it was? That's right, the operator. So um, you have to spin this thing on the right. Uh, and that uh, calls the operator. You pick up your, uh, this is your earpiece here, so you have to hold it up to your ear and you speak into the middle. Somebody says it kind of looks like a smiley face, and I guess I can see that. Um, so what, the reason and how I remember that Alexander Graham Bell invented the phone is right here. This is what would ring when you got a, a phone call coming in. 
So the only person you could call if you didn't guess it already uh, was this person over here, the operator. So they had to, and you can look at this, there was a, a later model here, still in black and white, so, uh, but they uh, had to connect your house to somebody else's house. So when we're looking at who you could call, the person with the most T in town uh, was the operator. Because occasionally they could listen in on your phone conversation. Um, I guess if you had something juicy to talk about, you didn't do it over the phone. In fact, silent Cal, Calvin Coolidge, uh, he refused to talk on the telephone while he was in the White House. I guess he thought that they were stealing the secrets or something. Uh, other ingenious inventions. Christopher Scholes came up with a typewriter in 1868. Now, uh, my typewriter that uh, I'll bring in on Monday is pretty old looking, um, but uh, still has what they call the QWERTY keyboard. Um, now, if we were to have typing class in ABC order, uh, it may have helped some people learn the typewriter a little bit better. Uh, however, typewriters weren't set up to work very well that way. Um, and the reason that they call it the QWERTY keyboard uh, was because of the arrangement of the letters. Uh, and they didn't want you to, because if, you type, if you're typing pretty quickly, uh, the hammers, which are down here on this uh, part, they'll come up and hit right there where you would have your paper. And that would in, put an indention on the thing uh, that would make the letter show up. Uh, well, if you put two common letters right next to each other, they would jam up a lot. And that was a, um, a slow process to unjam it, and you couldn't really type very quickly. So they arranged the keyboard in such a way back in the day, and you can ask Mr. Beery why did they do it this way. It was because it pre prevented the typewriter, early typewriter, from jamming up. Uh, and they continued to stick with that since the 1860s. Or 1868, I should say, ish. Uh, here is uh, the William Burroughs adding machine. I can't see that very well. It's moving down a little bit. Oh, there you go. So uh, the adding machine, there's a YouTube video that we'll watch again on Monday. Uh, I can't take a video of my screen very well with this uh, recording method. It looks very pixelated. So we'll just wait for Monday in person. Um, so if you look at uh, people that would benefit from this adding machine right here, these are the kinds of people that would quickly go out and pay almost whatever it costs. Now, we're, we're looking at the material that they used a lot, like the typewriter, and you'll see how heavy mine is on, well, you can't wait. Um, we can't have everybody pick it up because of that uh, COVID thing going around. Uh, but you'll be able to tell when I pick it up and put it down, it, it is a monster. It's about 35 pounds uh, for just a typewriter. Uh, this thing too. The reason it was so heavy was because what they could manipulate, and they could manipulate iron and they could manipulate steel at the time. So a lot of the original inventions had a lot of that stuff in it. Same thing with George Eastman. Again, a lot of iron and steel here. Plastic was not going to be invented for a while. Um, sorry, George Eastman was the camera. Uh, John Thurman invented the vacuum cleaner in 1899. Again, with this looks like a half a drum. It almost is identical to a shop vac today, uh, but this hose would go into your house, this gas powered thing would uh, work outside, uh, and you'd be able to move it. Uh, I guess you could have gas in the house, but that's kind of a general no-no because of carbon monoxide. Uh, I'll bring in a couple cameras on Monday also. Again, we can't touch them, sorry, but we can at least see uh, the past. Uh, so the Kodak box camera was invented by a guy named George Eastman uh, in 1888 a way for amateurs to take pictures at your own house. So they had pictures before 1888, but this was a, an easier way that an individual could make their own picture. It didn't have to be a professional picture. Uh, possibly the best inventor of all time. I tell my Scholar Bowl kids that if you're interested in uh, guessing correctly for guessing correctly if you're talking about an inventor. Um, the Wizard of Menlo Park, or Thomas Edison, was probably one of the best. So when you're thinking about an inventor, inventor Edison is a great guess. So uh, Thomas Edison was labeled dull by his teacher, Snow R on that damn bad. Who's my English teacher anyway? Crap. So, uh, and the reason that he was dull, uh, and he was most likely dyslexic, um, so it, that's a kind of a learning disorder today uh, that kind of manipulates, your brain doesn't manipulate the 
order and sequence of things. Uh, so even though as teachers labeled him dull, uh, he was probably one of the smartest men alive, probably the, the best thinkers of his generation. Uh, he had a whole list of inventions, uh, as well as being a hero, because uh, a boy had fallen on the tracks at the age of 12, and he kind of picked him up and moved him out of the way. So all of his inventions, some of the more, I guess, popular ones today, the automatic telegraph signaler, uh, was one of his first inventions. So this was a way, so he came up with a plan so he could sleep on the job, and this is what he did. He invented this mechanism that would uh, tabulate uh, what was coming in on the telegraph, uh, and he could just take a nap, and his machine would do all the work for him. So he was getting paid for something that a machine could do. So in the period of automation, we'll look at that over the next 100 years, um, it becomes much more efficient when we have machines do work that is previously done by hand. Uh, the phonograph was a mo another pr invention by Mr. Edison, as well as the motion picture projector, the telephone transmitter, and the battery. And we're going to be using some of Edison's batteries, uh, as well as his ability to harness the electricity um, and make the light bulb his most important invention 1879 uh, and in class on Monday uh, we have two experiments one will crank a, um, a permanent magnet generator uh, with use of a uh, kind of a stationary bike uh, and uh, we'll spin that thing fast enough uh, and we'll kind of explain a little bit more detail on Monday uh, that the bulb will actually illuminate uh, we'll also make a, a bulb with, or a homemade bulb, uh, with a filament, which is the inside part of a light bulb, done by a pencil lead, uh, and we'll connect two leads, a positive and negative, and we'll heat up that lead, which will make light. It's actually kind of bright. Uh, we may even be able to uh, uh, recreate that in video that on Monday in class. So we got lots to do. Uh, so here is that filament that we're going to make. So we're going to put, um, we call them alligator clips on one side and alligator clips on the other, uh, and put about 20 volts or 18 volts of electricity in between the two, and the result will be light. Now, the outside of this was uh, very important, and we will recreate with a jar of some kind, uh, because the air is going to make this part uh, not very efficient. Now, you probably don't have too many of these lights in your house today, and we'll look at uh, some of the differences uh, that we have had in light bulbs, but this was one of the original ones. Uh, 40 light bulbs near Christmas time uh, was lit up in Menlo Park in 1880, and people would come from miles around, kind of like people come to Candy Cane Lane. Same kind of idea, but they're used to lights being made of uh, gas and lanterns, kind of. Uh, but in 1880, uh, Edison was able to make it out of electricity. Uh, now, George Westinghouse uh, kind of aided uh, Edison's inventions by coming up with what he called transformers, not the movie with Megan Fox and uh, whatever the other guy's name was and the cars that turn into machines, but transformers transform the current uh, and ramped up the voltage, or potentially ramped down the voltage, uh, and he figured out that if we put uh, high voltage lines on the um, uh, through the poles, uh, the result would be more efficient transfer of power. So instead of having a little bit of current in the lines that come into your house, uh, probably on the outside of the pole you have tens of thousands of volts, and then they ramp that down uh, to about 240 volts that come into your house. So um, we're looking at uh, significance of jobs that maybe electricity was going to uh, erase. Uh, one of those jobs was uh, my dad's job when he was growing up, uh, and still up into the 1960s, they had to stoke the furnace, which meant that you had to go in the middle of the night, you had to pile coal in there. Well as we have electricity now, the electricity is maybe going to eliminate the fact that we don't have to heat our homes with coal anymore. Uh, and we can blow the uh, heat through our houses with fancy blowers because of the electricity. So we'll look at these things on Monday, but we need to first take a back step and look at some of the African-American inventors. 
uh, and how they improve some inventions in history also. Uh, Lewis Howard Latimer improved the filament for Edison. So we just talked about filament in a second. This is the first thing on an incandescent light bulb uh, that would burn out. And if this has a crack or a hole in it or breaks, uh, then the power from positive to negative doesn't connect anymore, and your light bulb burn out, and you have to have a new one. Uh, new ones like LED and even compact fluorescent are the ones that we have in school, the long straight ones, they call those uh, fluorescent bulbs. Um, and those are much more efficient. They use gas to excite the electricity on inside as opposed to a connected wire. Um, Granville Woods uh, came up with a thing called an automatic circuit breaker. We'll bring one of those in on um, Monday also. Uh, this is, uh, you probably have several of these in your house uh, that uh, carries the power efficiently and safely. And Eliza McCoy came up with a system for oiling machinery. So if that's, uh, we're thinking about people to invent things, a lot of times they maybe worked around this and all of a sudden like, hey, this would make my job a lot easier. What if we did this? So people are trying to invent things sometimes to be lazier. Uh, same with Janie Matzelger. Uh, he came up with a shoe making machine. Uh, and previously to this point, shoes were made by hand. Uh, but his machine was going to streamline the process. And also, if we can make it a lot easier, the price of things will go down. Uh, Henry Ford is probably the best at this. Now, usually what we do in class during non-COVID years, uh, we start an assembly line. Henry Ford patented the assembly line, although he went to a, a butcher's house, uh, or butcher's company, I should say, and um, he watched how efficiently the process was to you know to butcher up a cow and how everybody did a specific job and by the end of the day they got really good at it so if i posed you the question hey could you change a tire for me some of you guys would say yeah i could it would take me a little bit but if that's all you did all day every day by the end of the day you're going to be pretty good at it and this was ford's idea he would replicate you only had to do one kind of small job um, over and over and over and he figured that instead of building a whole car which was what people did they would put two or three people on the hey you build the whole car uh, now he's going to be have you hey you're just going to do the wheels or hey you're just going to do the steering wheel or hey you're just going to put in the engine uh, so the, these specific jobs we'll look at uh, on monday uh, and we'll look at some of the videos that go along with this uh, we did put a number on there, $700 was how much the first Model T's were selling for. Uh, and he wasn't the person that invented the car, but he invented a thing called interchangeable parts. Uh, and when we get the interchangeable parts done more efficiently, everybody can do it. Uh, selling goods is our last uh, major thing. And I kind of added this into um, what is happening uh, in your book. Uh, so uh, before online and Amazon Prime, buying stuff uh, from catalogs uh, was essential. Uh, Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward sold a lot of items through the mail. In fact, you could buy a whole kit for a house. They would deliver it. They do all the cuts for you. They deliver it right to your house, and you could put it together. Now, um, I guess they have similar things like that today, but uh, from something very small to something very large, all of it was sold online. I mean, online back in the 1860s. Uh, we'll watch the Macy's commercial in class. I think they just uh, celebrated their 160th uh, anniversary from being open. In the clip of the commercial, we see them going through a horse and buggy up to the Macy's store in downtown New York City. Now, Macy's is probably famous for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, which they have done several times in a row. Now, that looks like, um, uh, maybe backtrack a little bit, we're going to watch some clips and get go over the how-to on Monday, since we only have 26 minutes. On Tuesday, we'll have all the stuff here ready to go, and uh, we'll put together um, the light bulb and stuff. Maybe spoke a little bit too soon. Uh, farm equipment, to other essentials, uh, you know, and who would benefit from this? Hopefully, if you're thinking about this critically, you could see yourself maybe benefiting. If you owned a store, if you owned a shop, if you owned something, you could benefit. Um, the Woolworths building. 
uh, well, Woolworths uh, had five and ten cent stores. They specialized in household items. So today we might call that store the Dollar Tree. Um, but back then, everything in there was a nickel in some of the stores as soon as they came out early on. Now, a nickel would maybe buy you a lot. Like we said, $700 would buy you a whole car. So if you downscale and we put with inflation uh, what five cents would buy you, you could get you know, a pretty good deal for something for five cents. Now, um, one of the biggest buildings in New York City, and this is a kind of a very famous picture here, um, is called Men at Lunch. So a lot of immigrants, especially in New York City, and this is what Section 3 is going to talk about, is steel and the growth of cities and how we were able to build up and not out. So our next two chapters are going to be talking about you know, what people did for a living. Uh, you know, Smoking was probably not going to kill this guy here. Uh, one, I don't think they invented lung cancer yet. Uh, but two, they had a very difficult life. Uh, and they're eating you know, several hundred feet above uh, the streets of New York City. And this is just a typical lunch day for them. Instead of taking the ladder going all the way down to the ground floor, uh, they decide to take a little break here. And they're sitting on a big, huge steel girder. Now, you can't see the couple of floors that are built below them, uh, but the scale of this picture is enormous. And this is how New York City was going to uh, be built so tall uh, with the new use of steel uh, from a guy named Andrew Carnegie. So uh, make sure you fill out the rest of your worksheet. You're welcome to go back through the slides and preview the video. Uh, this will be for grades. So make sure you turn that in. And uh, also, make sure this weekend you don't do anything to cause harm or embarrassment to yourself, your school, your family, your social studies, your baseball coach, your community. Don't get arrested. Have a good weekend. Also, maybe don't have lunch on top of a big, tall building. Scary. <laughs>